Sorry, I was getting a little bit ahead of myself there. <laughs> hit the wrong button. I meant to hit this one. Here you go. Uh, All right. Crisis averted. Okay, so we left off about here. Hello, doggo. Okay, does anybody have any questions about any of this jazz so far? Given that the exam is on Friday. Okay, so we're going to be going over, hopefully, this. Actually, let's get this down a little bit. Zoomed in a bit. Uh, we'll be going over this, hopefully, on Wednesday, because uh, it's a pretty cool technique, experimentally. Um, and we can kind of do that as part of the whole biotechnology uh, transgenic thing. And so... Really, this in a way is part of um, when we talk about um, small non coding RNAs. The exam is this Friday on doop -doo, the 30th. So we have two class periods today and Wednesday. Um, then we'll be done. And this week is also the last week of lab too. So, yeah, we're kind of pretty much at the end of the road, to be honest. So, uh, these small non-coding RNAs are really important in controlling stability of the mRNA strand and also the initiation of translation right so these just this one slide in a sense kind of gets to two parts of the control of gene expression RNA stability and initiation of well control of the initiation of tran translation and this is actually a kind of essentially a very complex and poorly understood layer that kind of floats on top of all the other stuff um, that's involved in the sequence hypothesis of DNA to mRNA to protein, right? It's, uh, it's actually very poorly understood. We're kind of learning more and more about it as time goes on, particularly with the kind of high throughput uh, DNA sequencing technologies we have, but it's still not very well understood. Okay, so the last thing is that obviously we've, we're gonna have our protein and there are a lot of things that can happen to proteins after they are uh, folded into their final conformation. And so most eukaryotic proteins are modified. This is the rule, not the exception. And there are lots and lots and lots of modifications. The actual most um, common modification is phosphorylation, right? So let me just type out what that actually means. So basically that's the addition of a phosphate group to one of three different uh, amino acid residues. Let me move this over here a little bit. And that's to a serine, threonine, or tyrosine amino acid in the protein. So that's carried out by something called a kinase, and we'll get to this in a little bit more detail later. I forgot how much I hate writing out phosphorylation. So it's carried out by enzymes called kinases and removed by phosphatases. Phosphatases. 
So kinases and phosphatases are very specific. to both, well, typically to, um, to a target protein and to a specific residue. Right, so you can get some very, very specific uh, activation or inactivation of proteins by phosphorylation. Do, do, do. What else was I going to say? And essentially, the mix of pre P groups present and absent equals activation state of protein. So, this isn't just the case of you can add a phosphate and it's active, and you remove a phosphate and it's inactive. It can be a, a very complex kind of sum of all of the sites at which a protein can be phosphorylated. Is it on or is it off? Can be a mix of those, essentially. So that's a very big one. And there's, I think, at least, ah, go away, whatever that is, um, at least 20,000 known cases of phosphorylation in the human proteome, right? So that averages out at one per protein. And obviously, it's not just one per protein. Some can be phosphorylated in many different sites. But it just goes to show how common that is. So another big one is the attachment of sugars. This is called glycosylation. Actually, I should just change this, shouldn't I? Right. And this is particularly common in proteins that are in the cell membrane or attached to the outside of the cell membrane. Um, those are very common in um, kind of recognition of stuff, right? Could be recognition of pathogens or recognition of uh, kind of other things around, essentially. Those sugar residues are very, very important. They're actually one of the, the main things that we recognize on bacteria, funnily enough. And then there's also cleavage, right? So many proteins require cutting up, essentially, before they're active. Uh, one that I worked on as a PhD student, actually, uh, needed post-translational processing. So in the sum, these essentially can both activate and deactivate uh, proteins, right? There are lots of different examples of both those. I'm going to give you a couple of different ones about uh, phosphorylation and cleavage, right? And these are, uh, this one was actually from a, a paper that I wrote a while back. Not work that I did, this was done by someone else, but they're really, really nice pictures, right? This was actually done by a, a friend of mine, um, a, a different institution. So essentially, uh, we're looking at one uh, gene here. This is called DAF16 which stands for DAO affected, and it's a transcription factor. Actually, it's a specific type of transcription called a forkhead transcription factor, or FOXO. I don't actually know where the FOXO comes from, but anyway. And this is involved in insulin signaling in worms and humans and mice and all kinds of uh, different organisms, right? And so basically, its means of control, like how that transcription factor's activity is regulated, is about where it is, right? So in cases where there is uh, um, little insulin signaling, it stays in the cytoplasm, right? And so that's kind of what this looks like over here, if you look in the bottom left, right? You can actually see this is a fluorescence micrograph, and uh, you can see that these cells here, you can see a lot of GFP or green fluorescent protein in the cytoplasm. So this is this here is one individual cell here. And the dark patch in the middle is the nucleus, right? So that protein is not present in the nucleus, it is inactive, right? Now, when you uh, dephosphorylate, and it's there because it's phosphorylated, 
I will talk about what these mean in a little bit. So if you phosphorylate that protein, it stays in the cytoplasm. It can't go into the nucleus. And if it's not in the nucleus, it can't activate gene expression. So in the re result of insulin signaling, so say uh, insulin is detected by the cell and um, transduces that signal into the cell, you dephosphorylate that protein and now it goes into, hey, stop it. It goes into the nucleus and now it can activate transcription of the genes that it recognizes, right? So if you remember way back boo, 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 up here, I got to go away up here now. So essentially this, um, DAF16 protein, this forkhead transcription factor, is one of these, right? So it's a protein that recognizes specific DNA sequences and promoters. And those promoters are of genes which are turned on in response to insulin signaling. So when that protein is dephosphorylated, it can now go into the nucleus. It can now bind to the promoters of the genes which it controls and it can turn them on. Now, if you want to turn that whole program off, say insulin levels decrease. Ooh, I'm sorry. All you have to do is dephosphorylate or phosphorylate that protein, sorry. And now you yoink it back out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm and it's no longer available to turn on transcription. And this is fairly common, right? It's actually, a, it's, a, it's used by multiple different uh, proteins. Sorry, I'm just gonna mute myself. Specifically of transcription factors. Now what these pictures are actually showing are a couple of mutants and this is, uh, Super, super cool. Um, and actually, it's yeah, one of the neatest bits of work. This is a, a, a parasite protein. It's from a parasite of humans and things called jerds. What the hell are jerds? Like, kind of like hamsters, I guess. Um, this is a parasite of humans called Strongyloides stercoralis, right? Which is very similar to the one that I worked on as a PhD student. And what they're showing here is that this is actually normal protein, right? So you get a mix of active forkhead transcription factor in the nucleus, which is that round bright dot, and you get a bunch in the cytoplasm. Now you can actually mutate this protein. Remember I said that um, kinase recognizes specific amino acid residues serines, tyrosines, and threonines. Well, if you know which of those inner protein are actually phosphorylated, you can change them. And you can change them to an amino acid residue which looks like it's phosphorylated, I don't know how, and or to one which cannot be phosphorylated, right? A different amino acid residue without affecting the actual structure of the protein. And that's what these are. So this is called phosphomimetic. And what that means is that it mimics uh, a phosphorylated protein, right? Because you've changed the specific amino acid residues so that cellular machinery thinks that that protein is always phosphorylated. And now you can see instead of being a mix of both nuclear and cytoplasmic, now it's purely cytoplasmic, right? It forces all of that protein out, right? And again, this is a uh, transgene, right? So this is a, a copy of this protein fused to GFP, right? So you can see where it is. And if you do the opposite, right? So you cannot phosphorylate that protein, right? You change that amino acid residue to something else. Now it is purely nuclear, right? And so you can actually fiddle around with this experimentally and show that this behaves in this particular way, which I think is pretty neat.
Anybody got any questions? Not you, dog. And so quite often there, there are many different ways of controlling transcription factor activity, but localization is one of the really neat ones. And actually one of my uh, research products, I wonder if I can dig that up somehow. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. Do I have this in? This might work. There you go. So this is uh, some pictures that I've taken um, a while ago. And so this is another one. This is a transcription factor that turns on lipid synthesis or genes involved in lipid synthesis. And so this one, in this is wild type. You can see uh, bright nuclear GFP and a faint cytoplasmic GFP, right? So this is uh, uh, another transgenic construct. These are intestinal cells. Right? So this is a worm and these are the first two cells of the intestine. Now forget all this bright stuff over here because that's a different GFP marker. But in this one, if you change the activity of this particular protein, right, that uh, transcription factor is less nuclear oriented, I guess. You find more of it in the cytoplasm relative to the nucleus than you do in a wild type animal, right? So you can use this not just as a, well, it's something that happens, but I'm actually using this as a tool to figure out, okay, I've got this particular gene and I can futz around with it. What effect do those modifications or manipulations have on the localization of this particular protein? Right. And so you can use this as a readout to kind of go, OK, well, if I change the activity of this, do I get this or do I get this, you know, and vice versa. Right. So it's a really neat kind of tool to use to figure out what effect on transcription you're having. Right. And at the end of the day, by and large, most things that affect what a cell does occur through transcription. Not always, there are other mechanisms, but that's kind of the main one. So anyway, this is a really neat uh, aspect. And this, oh, actually, this isn't by phosphorylation, this is by cleavage, right? So this protein is normally retained in the cytoplasm because it's tethered to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so when it's activated, it's actually cut or cleaved, and then it's free to travel into the nucleus which is pretty neat. Where am I at? Here we go. Okay, anybody got any questions so far? And this I'm 100% sure I've uploaded this already. But anyway, if I uh, make any changes today, I'll upload it to the Blackboard. But this was uploaded last week. So the most current version is, is this one, and this one is on Blackboard. So again, you're not actually changing the protein itself. You're simply adding something to it, and doing so quite often actually changes either the shape of the protein a little bit, or how that protein is recognized by other proteins. And actually, one of the real neat things is that quite often you can have what are called, called kinase cascades. And so basically what that is, is uh, I hate Ryan phosphorylation. It's such a chore. Anyway, phosphorylation of one kinase activates it. So it can phos for really the there you go the next kinase 
which activates it. And so on and so forth, right? So essentially, uh, each step is activated by the previous step in that cascade, right? So this is a way of amplifying the signal too, right? So you don't just have to do one protein and then another protein does another protein. Now you get multi like this expansion of activated proteins, which is pretty neat. Okay, so again, remember kinase is phosphorylate, phosphatase is dephosphorylate. Okay, anyone have any questions? All right. So next one I want to talk about, and this is a kind of pretty neat example, is of cleavage. And you can have a similar kind of deal here as well of a cleavage cascade. Pardon me. And so one of my most favorite examples of this, other than the work that I do myself, is of blood clotting, or rather wound clotting. Right, and so you know that when you, uh, you know, fall over, scrape yourself or cut yourself with a kitchen knife or something like that, you know, you bleed for a while and then hopefully, if it's not too bad, it ends up not bleeding anymore, right? And this is a real, real handy uh, thing to do because obviously if you keep bleeding, eventually you, lo you lose all your blood and you die, right? And so, and also as well, you know, that uh, hole, in you is a way for things you don't want in you, such as pathogens like bacteria and particularly bacteria and fungi and things like that to get in, right? So that kind of breaks that kind of external barrier that we have, our skin uh, that keeps a lot of nasties out. And so this is a very, very important uh, process. And actually, if you screw this up, you end up with something called hemophilia. Right, and that's actually due to a deficiency in uh, one of these clotting factors. Yeah, I can't remember exactly which one. I think eight. There's a lot of them. So anyway, the the basic process is uh, you know you have a damaged blood vessel, whatever reason. Uh, let's say it's caused by a cut, and that essentially the damage to that line in triggers the release or production of things called clotting factors, right? So these are other proteins that uh, are the first signaling stage of this process, right? And as you can see, this is kind of a cascade of events, right? And so what happens next is uh, you have this uh, protein floating around in your blood called prothrombin, right? And as prothrombin, it does absolutely nothing, it is completely inert, right? But when that prothrombin is cleaved, it gets cleaved to something called thrombin. And now this is an enzyme, right? So this has enzymatic activity and its job is to find fibrinogen, right? So the, the basic step is the release of these clotting factors, these, uh, Clotting factors activate platelets. We should probably all heard about their kind of small protein complexes. And those platelets basically kind of start plugging up the hole with blood vessels, right? That's kind of the, the job, right? So it gives a kind of an immediate slowdown in the loss of blood and kind of sealing that hole. Also, the the neat thing is that the, the blood vessels constrict, called vasoconstricting, right, which also reduces the amount of blood loss because there's less blood actually going through that uh, blood vessel. And then the final step is the production of these fibrin strands. And so fibrin, uh, essentially, it, it makes a mesh, right? So it sticks to each other and causes this big mat of protein to form. And so that, again, leads to more blood vessels being stuck to it, 
right? Because they're kind of snared or enmeshed in that. Uh, it kind of solidifies the clot, so it's more kind of physically um, sealed, I guess. And then that allows over time, presumably up here, if you've got like a broken uh, skin or whatever, that then allows that uh, hole, that physical hole, to actually start knitting together, right, through formation of collagen plugs and stuff like that. And so this is a very progressive stepwise process, right? Where you have the damage that releases the signals, those signals lead to vasoconstriction and these platelets being activated. And then following on, you get the formation of a fibrin uh, mesh and a, a kind of a hardened blood clot. Now, this is obviously something that you don't want happening when you don't have a damaged blood vessel, because you can imagine what would happen if your fibrin got uh, activated and just started forming a mesh in one of your blood vessels. Essentially, you'll have a blood clot in you. And if that ended up in the wrong place, such as your heart or your brain, that would lead to a stroke or a heart attack, right? If it blocked a blood vessel. So this has to be very, very, very tightly controlled. And that's often why you have these somewhat complex stepwise processes because it adds extra control to this process, right? So you're, you have to overcome several hurdles, right? For this process to actually work, right? It's part of the, the control of that. And so when you look at it in kind of greater detail, this is actually what it looks like, right? So this is prothrombin. Let me blow this up a little bit. Right, and this is a kind of a molecular model of, of the protein itself. And essentially, it's, I don't know why it's called Kringle. Sometimes I just don't understand why they call things certain things, but anyway. So essentially what we have here is the active uh, enzyme, well, the catalytic domain, sorry, it's not active. But when it's attached to the, these other bits of the protein, it doesn't work, right? So this is catalytically inactive in this form. It's only when this catalytic domain is cleaved, it's physically cut, by those clotting factors, XA and uh, 10A and 5A, now we have catalytically active thrombin, right? So that's the first cleavage step. And then the second is that we have this protein called fibrinogen. And essentially fibrinogen, let's just go over here, put that there. Oh, I'm sorry, Jelani. Um, this is cut by the clotting factors or some of the clotting factors. I don't actually really understand the clotting factors themselves very well, to be honest, because um, there's quite a lot of them and they all do different things. But essentially the clotting factors are released on damage of the, the blood vessel lining, right? So this is supposed to be one continuous thing. And when it's not, that results in the production of these clotting factors. And so there's a, a cascade in here as well from what I can remember, although I don't understand it as well. But the output of that is uh, two clotting factors, which are also enzymes, and they cut the, the prothrombin just here, just in this part here. Right, and this is uh, presumably an important um, pair of residues. And so that's kind of part of the whole cleavage cascade deal, essentially. Um, and now, let's move this back over here. Fibrinogen is a, it's a really funky looking protein, actually. If you look up like a, um, actually, let's have a look, see what, rather than tell you, I'll show you.
Yeah, so it looks like that, basically. And so it's made of multiple chains. I think it's eight in total, four on each side. And in its normal format, those cannot stick to each other. Where are we at? Here we go. Right, and so the ends of each of those chains has uh, like groups on them that basically make the, this protein non-sticky, right? It's kind of the easiest way of describing that. And so this floats around in your blood all the time. It's... Oh, sorry. It's always present. And what thrombin does is it cuts those little groups off. That's it, nothing else, right? It doesn't change the shape of the protein. It doesn't cleave it into separate pieces. All it does is it just trims off the ends of those chains. And now this turns into what's called fibrin now, right? It's essentially the same thing, but it's now sticky. And so fibrin can now stick to other fibrin molecules, right? In a kind of a pairwise way. And then essentially that just keeps happening until you have this huge kind of mesh of fibrin all stuck to each other, right? And that's what creates, come on, this mesh that you see over here. That's what permanently seals that uh, hole in the blood vessel. And as soon as that happens, then the, the blood vessel dilates back to its normal size and blood flow can resume, right? Because again, you don't want this process to take too long because you don't want to shut off uh, blood flow to you know, a particular region because then those cells will start dying through lack of oxygen. So it's, it's pretty neat. Yeah, so prothrombin is essentially the, the trigger, right? The, the, main trig, the main insurance really is fibrinogen, right? So fibrinogen is the thing which can be turned into the mat. It's like having, um, actually, they, in, in the US, in the military, they have this crazy stuff that is um, like expanding foam. Um, don't know if you've ever seen that for uh, kind of infantry or combat medics, right? So if you have a traumatic injury like a gunshot, they just stick this tube into you and press the trigger. It's like kind of that spray foam that you seal gaps in your walls and stuff, right? And so that basically just fills the hole and stops bleeding. And really fibrinogen is, is kind of like that, you know, uh, foam in a can, essentially, that you carry around with you in your blood. So that's really the blood vessel insurance. All of this stuff, the clotting factors and the prothrombin and thrombin and so on, that's the trigger, right? That's what controls when that insurance is activated. And the reason is, is that this fibrinogen you don't want it ha kicking off when it's not needed. It's much the same as, you know, you don't want one of your squad mates to stick one of those cans in your ear and then squeeze it, right? Because you wouldn't be able to hear anything, right? That's obviously kind of like a, a joke example, but, you know, blood clots are very, very serious things, right? And blood clots ending up where they shouldn't is uh, extraordinarily dangerous. So uh, by definition, a stroke is when a uh, uh, small chunk of um, uh, arterial plaque, typically. So it's just kind of like fatty deposits that build up in your arteries. And actually, if those blocks occur in your heart, that's what leads to a heart attack. But if one of those blocks of stuff uh, floats off, or breaks off and it ends up in a uh, blood vessel leading to your brain, then it blocks off blood flow and without blood flow, you don't get oxygen and that's a stroke, right? So this is not something that you want to activate if it is not absolutely necessary. 
And so really these are all of the kind of trigger guards and checks and firing pins and safeties or whatever you want to call them that prevent fibrinogen, fibrinogen from kicking off and turning into fibrin when it's not needed. But when it is needed, all of these things activate in this cascade of the clotting factors, then the activation of thrombin, and then the activation of fibrinogen, or fibrin rather, to generate this, uh, this structure. So it's really, really neat. It's, it's, it's actually a super cool example. Anyway, any questions on any of the above? Anything, actually, anything, 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 right? Because there's a lot of material here, and this is very rich and fertile territory for questions on the exam. Hint, hint. Wink, wink. We'll also have time on Wednesday for a kind of recap uh, question section. Oh, okay. What do you want? Maybe that'll fix it. Uh, so bring questions with you on Wednesday because we have a little bit left uh, to study, but I'd rather spend a little bit more time making sure that you really understand this stuff very well because there's a lot here, right? And if you think about the kind of overall picture, there's an astonishing amount of stuff going on in the control of eukaryotic gene expression. Right, because just oh, go away. I don't want iCloud anyway. Um, just in this one example, right? Fibrinogen is a protein that has to be expressed, right? So its con its expression is controlled. It's presumably uh, produced at higher levels after lots of you know blood vessel damage because the levels of this in your blood decrease, right? So. All of these things that we've been talking about up here from, you know, chromatin uh, formation or chromatin state, rather, chromatin remodeling, methylation, which goes all the way down here, you know, transcription factors, what are the transcription factors that turn on uh, fibrinogen, fibrinogen expression, right, what are the different Crees or cis regulatory elements? You know, does it have different promoters? Is it alternately spliced? I don't think it is. Um, what are the various uh, activator proteins, right, which are uh, present and so on and so forth, right? You know, how stable is that mRNA and whatever? And it all ends up essentially with a protein that doesn't do anything. Right, because that protein has to then be modified further by another protein, thrombin in this case, uh, before it can do anything. Right, so this protein is essentially non-functional. Right, in its uh, as produced state, it has to be modified further before it can do anything. So methylation is oh, actually, yeah, that's a good point. You can, that's a good question, actually. I was thinking, no, whoa, actually, yes. So methylation is, or, and or acetylation is typically of histones. So it is a post-translational modification without a doubt. It's actually a really good example, um, which changes its state, its conformation, right? Oh, you're making me write phosphorylation type phosphorylation again. again. So phosphorylation is, I mean, not all proteins are phosphorylated, right? 
uh, some will never be phosphorylated or dephosphorylated or anything. Some of them are really potentially not even post-translationally modified, right? But there are many, many proteins which are, right? Actually, this is generally the rule rather than the exception. And phosphorylation is the most common of those post-translational modifications by a long, long, long shot. And there are lots of other ones, right? So this, this list here is not an exclusive one. Right, so there's there's other ones, uh, sumoli sumoliation, sumulation. Um, there's, uh, if you remember way back, whoa, 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 up here, come on, degradation of protein too. Right, so this is often through a process called ubiquitinylation, right, which tags a protein for uh, degradation, right, to go into the proteasome. And so there are lots and lots of other tags. Um, and again, in all honesty, I don't know them all. There's, there's more stuff out there the, than, than, than what I know. Um, but those are the most uh, common ones, essentially. However, for DNA, the only modification that I'm aware of is methylation, methylation of cytosines. So as you can see, proteins have a lot more bells and whistles available than DNA does. And really that's because DNA is just a storage of information, right? It's, it's in many ways uninteresting. Right, everybody gets all excited about DNA because it contains the genetic code and stuff. But it may, it does do that. Not it may do. Huh, it does, but it doesn't do anything in and of itself. It's the proteins that are encoded in DNA that do stuff. And so there are many, many, many ways in which you can modify those proteins to make them do different things or go to different places. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so we're kind of at the end, close to the end of a, a lecture. I'm not really sure it's worth uh, kicking into another topic right now. So what we're going to do on Wednesday is I'm actually going to uh, beef this up a little bit. So this is kind of part of my, you know, continuing improvement of my my slides and also why I upload them, you know, uh, upload PowerPoints over the course of the semester as those things get changed. Um, but on Wednesday, we'll spend a little bit of time going through the transgenics uh, PowerPoint and particularly what I want to talk about are RNA interference, which is really uh the application of uh this process right and it is one of the most important kind of discoveries that's been made in recent times and the other one which is equally important possibly even more so to be honest right is the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, right? And so uh, we'll spend some time going through that because that is, that is both mind-boggling and scary, right? Really scary, actually, in many ways as applied to, to humans. I don't know if anyone's watched Gattaca, uh, which is a kind of film noir sci-fi with... Um, Shoot, what's the name from Kill Bill? I can't remember. Anyway, a couple of cool actors and actresses. Um, but it's all about eugenics, right? And so CRISPR-Cas9 is actually potentially the Pandora's box, which could lead to that. Uh, so that will also be fun to talk about, both from the technology side and also the, 
the ethics side as too, because you know we don't work in isolation, we're part of our society. And then there'll be a little bit of extra time after that to ask questions, right? So if you haven't, uh, hang on a sec, Johnny. Um, if you haven't done so already, start going over the material we've covered and start making lists of questions. Uh, generally, yeah, the biotechnology basics, um, we're just going to skip over that. We've spent a bit longer on eukaryotic gene expression than tabled for in the schedule, largely because it's, I think, more important. And there have been some additions and all sorts of other stuff. The schedule this, this semester has been all kinds of weird and wacky. Um, so we're going to just skip the biotechnology basics one. We can refer back to it. Um, but it won't be on the exam, right? So only material that we cover in class will be uh, in the exam. Yeah, and Rogelio, Rogelio that's, that, I mean, that's kind of part of the, the reason for that is that, you know, PowerPoint 17 and 18 are the, the really important ones, right? And the, the ones after that are just, you know, icing on the cake. And so I really want to focus on what's important because that's what will be useful to you in the future. Uh, but I also want to talk about some cool stuff as well, because, you know, it can't all just be, you know, work, work, work. You have to have a little bit of fun. And so that's why I'll be uh, spending a little bit of time, I don't know, 20 minutes or so of the lecture on, on Wednesday on these two topics, not the rest of the, the PowerPoint, germline transformation is interesting, right? I'm not going to say it isn't. Um, but again, we have a limited amount of time left. And so I want to use that to as efficiently as possible. So yeah, only the material that we cover in class will be material for the exams. <laughs> you have any idea how annoyed students would be if I gave them a secret final exam? My SRIs will be terrible. Um, no, uh, the last exam is on Friday and it's not cumulative, even though essentially every exam is cumulative because it builds on the knowledge that you've learned before. But it will only cover the material that we've covered since the we since you took exam three. Right. So it's non cumulative in the formal sense. And it will be on Friday. It will be the same format as before. It'll open at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, and then it'll close at midnight. Uh, Jimena, I haven't actually checked, to be honest. I'll have to dig around in the email that got sent to me to find out how. Um, but I would imagine it'll take a little while. Probably, hopefully, by the end of the week, most people will have done their SRIs. But when, every, when, when the deadline occurs because I can't really you know uh, make my own deadline before that uh, but once it occurs and then, then I'll let everybody know whether or not you got the extra credit usually people do I mean it's it's not a particularly hard thing to do to get a few extra points um, it's just a little bit of an incentive to do so because the more feedback I get the more useful the feedback is cool all right everybody uh, thanks for stopping by Again, don't forget, like we did last time, bring some questions with you and we'll go through them on Wednesday. Awesome. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>